So God's intent through human intent, to some degree, we're going to summarize some of the things uh, that uh, we have been talking about. And the first uh, thing I would mention is that when God is seeking to communicate through inspired writers, through scripture, he is using the language of the prophet's past. God is using the language of the prophet's past. And uh, if we think of all of the Bible as prophecy, in a sense, as, as speaking for God, uh, the language of the Bible is the language of the prophet's past. And I, I should point out that that's the only language we know. Uh, where did you learn the words that you learned? In your native language, you learned them very, very early. Um, a two-year-old child is bouncing around the house and uh, hands something to someone and the person says, thank you. Child has no idea what that means. Thank you, thank you. You know, but it's sort of there and they file it away and they go on. A couple weeks later, they hand something to someone, they say thank you again, thank you. I remember, I heard that before, what is that? Still have no idea what it means. After three or four encounters, even if no one ever explains it to them, they begin to get it. You give something somebody, they give you thank you back. And so then the child, every time someone brings thank you, thank you, and they may not still know exactly what it means, but they're beginning to develop a knowledge. Our language is a product of our life's experience. And if somebody wants to communicate with us, they have to be able to communicate in terms of that past language, that lifelong experience that we bring to every conversation. So anytime two people are talking, they're each bringing their life experience with that language into this engagement. In the process, each of them may learn some new words. Each of them may learn new ways to handle language. Each of them will learn ideas that they had not been prepared uh, to understand before. So in that encounter, uh, communication takes place. So all language, you could say, is the language of the past. As God meets people where they are. Now, I forgot there, uh, uh, Gulbert, uh, you made a comment uh, during the break that I think would be good for everyone else to hear. If I'm not, uh, if I'm not surprising you too much, I was going to let you come back on that. Uh, God meeting people where they are, that, that had a particular impact on you that I thought was interesting and helpful. Yes, um, it, it did. I'll try to find the proper words. To yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. One of the things Dig into your past. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, during our second session, I was thinking about um, clients, patients that I work with, hospice patients. And I was thinking about um, where they were spiritually. And I, and I think of being spiritual independent. Um, versus dependent upon um, um, religiosity, um, dependent upon um, a preacher say so. Um, for example, if I have a, a, a patient that I work no, with. No, people thinking for themselves. Right. Kind of, yeah. yeah, meeting God meeting them where they are. For example, I have a case where, or cases where you have a, a patient who hasn't gone to church for 5, 10, 15, 20 years no longer attached to a congregation of any type. Um, but now they are dying. And they, they need to hear a word from God. They need reassurance from God that God is here in this space, in this time with them. Um, and I often thought, as their chaplain, you know, how do I meet that spiritual need? How do I bring God to them? And oftentimes I don't have a plan. I'm there in the space, in the time with them. And oftentimes God does his thing. So I'm thinking about long term, I mean, from the class, are we talking about being spiritually independent, where God speaks to us individually? God comes to us where we are, versus God coming to us as part of a group, of a community of a church. I think that's the question that I have in my, in my mind, in my head. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and the other thing that I wrestle with too is, beside that, how do, how does God come to a church in our present day, today? How does God meet that that particular need that they are struggling with? Am, am I in the right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. To struggle well, with the words. But. That second question is actually what we'll address in the next section, the the D section oh. of here. Is, is how does God speak to the larger group? And I, and I guess related to this is, can you have unity and spiritual independence, as you put it? Are, are, do those two things go together? Or are they in conflict with each other? Anyone else uh, reacting to that? You know, when you, when you come to a patient, uh, they've got their horizon. You may know nothing except what you see on the chart. So the very first step is get to know their story, get to know their horizon, get to know where they are. You can't meet them where they are until you know where they are. So I think that's, that's a side lesson of all of this. But you look at the seven churches, you know, coming back to the spiritual independence, each of those seven churches was quite different, and God approached each of them differently. Now, his goal for them may be a particular place where he's going to bring them all together, but they are, they are starting, at least, from, from very wide, different spaces. Yeah. Are we no. talking about creating theology? individually or are we talking about that separately and creating meaning for people individually? You would see a difference between theology and meaning? Well, for the lack, lack of a better time to think about this, yeah. <laughs> okay. I guess I'm meaning concepts of God versus how he's reaching someone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Jerome? Well, one of the points um, that we as chaplain sort of lingers on is, as you rightly mentioned earlier, is meeting the people where they are, the patient where they are. Um, I cannot uh, leave the way or enter a room with preconceived ideas or I have to try and see what is important to the, to the patient, how to so in some of the assessment that we use, one of them asks, what is God to you? How do you conceive God? Do you conceive God as a, some may conceive God as a shepherd. Some may conceive God as a powerful, as a, as a king, as a ruler. How do you conceive him? And um, oftentimes, based on how they conceive God, that's where we as chaplain are able to penetrate, mm -hmm. uh, penetrate, um, to provide that sort of spiritual um, support or pastoral care to that individual. But it's important to meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. and Is that where theology and meaning come together, perhaps? I think so. Uh, that that, that, that the, the picture you have of God is a place where people seek to find their meaning. And if, as, as you get to know their picture of God, you may have other pictures that will be helpful to them, that, that their, their lack of knowledge of those pictures may be keeping them from finding the meaning. All right. Okay, so God then uses the language of the prophet's past to communicate with them. We seek to know the language of a patient's past, for example, to try to understand what they are bringing to the conversation before we say too much. Let me give you an example. Um, Revelation 13. Revelation 13. This is a well-known text uh, in uh, many Christian contexts and certainly in Seventh-day Adventist contexts. Revelation 13. If you, if you go to Seventh-day Adventist history, uh, this chapter played a very important role uh, and uh, has often been 
associated with uh, the United States, its development as a country and its future and so forth. But let's take a look at the passage and read it for a moment through John's eyes. And let's go to verse 13. <clears throat> Speaking about a beast from the earth, verse 13, it says, It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in the sight of all. Now, where is that language coming from? Yes, John receives it in a vision. Okay, but if God meets people where they are, then that language is going to connect with John's past somewhere. And that's what we've got to look for. Where is John's past? How does that affect what God chooses to give to him? All right. So this fire from heaven, is there anything in John's past that might be significant here? You see, if we read it from our past, we might, there's a lot of things we might think of. We might think of jet planes, you know, with smoke coming out the back, um, fire coming down from heaven. Uh, we might think of smart bombs, you know, going after terrorists or something like that. I mean, we'd have our own analogies, but those might mislead us in terms of understanding what John is being communicated here. Fire from heaven. Can you think of anything? in John's past that might be relevant here. Was he the one who asked Christ to call fire from heaven upon the... Assuming it's the same John, which I think we generally do. Uh, he uh, was asking Jesus on one occasion to bring fire down from heaven and consume a city. So it's a fire of judgment. Okay. God's judgment fire. Any other fire from heaven? Elijah. He, he was Elijah, yeah, the, the, the uh, Mount Carmel experience. You know, the, 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 the true God, you know, come down here and show, show yourself by fire. Any other possibilities? Fire from heaven. Can you think of one in the New Testament that John would have known about? But isn't this John the Revelator different John than the one in the Gospel? That's a conversation that scholars are having all the time. <laughs> um, is the author of the Gospel of John also the author of Revelation? Or, or are they two different people? And uh, I don't think that conversation is concluded. Uh, most conservative Christians would say they are the same. That, the, the, you know, that John, the disciple of Jesus, ended up in Ephesus and then on Patmos and he receives the vision and then he writes the gospel from Ephesus later on. Now that's not a universal uh, truth. A lot of scholars uh, see it differently but that's the picture that most of the early writers had that, that they were the same person. Um, but still let's, let's just, all right, let's just say it's a John. We don't know who it is but he's an early Christian and he's familiar with the Gospels and some of the early writings, you know, from 20 years earlier, 30 years earlier. Uh, is there any fire from heaven? Pentecost. You have tongues of fire coming down from heaven. All right. So, what is John getting here? That's the process of interpretation. You've got several possibilities here. You have the fire of Elijah, the Mount Carmel, experience. You have the fire of Pentecost. Uh, what was, there was another one mentioned. Uh, so he was going down, go, uh, Jesus was passing through Samaria. Oh yeah, yeah, the, the fire of judgment yeah. to destroy. A similar one, Elijah also uh, is being attacked by squads of 50 soldiers and fire yeah. comes down and destroys them. So the fire of judgment, is that what is, is going on here? Well, but wouldn't he have just been also would have known and read the books of the Torah because he was a Jew mm -hmm. and I mean, my first thought was the story of Elijah and the so Elijah, Elisha and the servants of Baal and Jezebel's mm -hmm. right. and then just reading about Cain and Abel and 
Abraham and all of those stories. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, maybe he would have just thought about the stories that he'd read about. Well, you remind me that there was a fire from heaven in the Abraham story. Destruction of Sodom. And again, that would be a judgment uh, kind of a use. So you have, you have several options here. And the question is, which one is he referring to? Or all of the above? And is, the commandment, when the commandment when it was given, it was fire. Okay. Uh, up on the mountain, mountain burned with fire and so smoking and, and so forth. Uh, so it's not impossible that you could have a reference to the, to the giving of the commandments. So the question would be, and by the way, uh, we, we're not, this is not a class in Revelation, but while we're on this topic, just to see, so, so you can see how hermeneutics works, how interpretation works. Throughout chapter 13, you have constant allusions to the commandments. Thou shalt have no other God before me, and yet the beast from the sea commands worship of itself. Thou shalt not set up graven images, but the beast from the, uh, from the land sets up an image and asks people to worship it. Uh, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain, and yet this beast has the names of blasphemy all over it. Remember the Sabbath day, but there's a mark of the beast which uh, counterfeits uh, the fourth commandment. So there's, there's references to the commandments all through. So that suggests, you know, to say Exodus 19 at this point, it's not impossible. You see, as you're doing interpretation, you're trying to see what is the best fit uh, for that. And your guiding light is God meeting people where they are. It's got to be something that makes sense to the original recipient. John may not have understood everything that God had in mind, but it's got to make sense in his world because that's what we've seen constantly uh, in all of the examples that we've looked at. Okay, interesting one. You could argue that the beast from the land is a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit because it gives breath to the image of the beast. That word is pneuma, Holy Spirit, pneuma. It gives spirit. So this is the breath giver, like, like back in the Garden of Eden. It brings fire from heaven, Pentecost. The land beast doesn't promote himself, he's promoting the sea beast, which happens to be a counterfeit of Christ in, in the text, in the story. Uh, he has a death and a resurrection, a ministry that lasts 42 months, you know, things like that. So there's a dynamic going on where you could say this Pentecost thing makes a lot of sense. On the other hand, does the Mount Carmel story come in over and over in the book of Revelation? It does. In fact, the word Har Megiddon is mountain of Megiddo. And Megiddo was a city at the base of Mount Carmel. So you go to Megiddo and you see the Mount Carmel range there, and that's where Elijah met the prophets of Baal. So uh, this whole idea that Mount Carmel is in view, maybe the Exodus is in view, the, the Mount Sinai, uh, maybe Pentecost is in view. You see, these are the language of John's past gives you clues as to where this uh, message of God is going to take him. And if it takes him in a certain place, we ought to know that because we might need to be in the same place. All right, so chapter 13, verse 13, 14. By the signs that it allowed to perform on behalf of the beast, it deceives the inhabitants of the earth telling them to make an image for the beast who had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. This beast from the land is seeking to deceive the nations of the earth by performing signs. Now, you go back in the Old Testament. Is there a place in the Old Testament where signs are performed in order to persuade that uh, a false god is true? The magicians, Pharaoh's magicians, sought through miracles to persuade Pharaoh that their gods were more powerful than the God of Moses. And so lurking behind verse 14 is the idea of these uh, Pharaoh's magicians. Verse 15, another angel came up out of the temple 
calling with a loud voice to the one who sat on the cloud. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I slipped into chapter 14. Okay. Uh, 13, 15. It was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast could even speak and cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Remind you of anything? Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel. The, the guys. The three guys in the fiery furnace. Yeah, yeah. Image is set up. Command to worship. If you don't worship, you'll be killed. And uh, Daniel 3 is lurking in the background here. So as, as John is writing this story down, he is experiencing images from his past. He's drawing out from his stock of past language scriptural images that uh, would help us to understand. By the way, uh, how big is the statue? We just read it. Okay, it's, it's 60 cubits high, 6 cubits wide. Does that mean anything to you? In Revelation 13. 666. Hmm. All right. You got numbering sixes in, in uh, Daniel 3. You've got this image repeated in Revelation 13. And now related to all that is the number 666, multiple sixes. By the way, um, Babylonian numbering is in sixes. It's a hexagesimal system. We operate with a decimal system based on tens. Babylonians operate on a sexagesimal system operating on sixes. You say, what sort of a silly method of mathematics is that? A satanic one. <laughs> yeah, right here. 60 seconds make a minute. 60 minutes make an hour. 24 hours make a day. That's sexagesimal system. You see, so we inherited the way we do time uh, from the Babylonians. So uh, all of these dynamics are things that John likely would have been familiar with, and God meets him where he is. God uses the language of his past to describe, in this case, the future. We noticed that with the Messianic prophecies. He used prophet like Moses, king like David, a priest like Melchizedek. So using the language of the past to project that which would happen in the future. You can also use the language of the past to talk about the present, but it's the only language that we know. A second, second point under this uh, section. God's intent is expressed through the human writer's intent. This is, this is the great mystery of Scripture. It's the Word of God, and it's also the Word of men. It's divine, and it's human at the same time. God uses human frailty. The book of Revelation is loaded with grammatical errors. And if any of you are familiar with Ellen White, her handwritten manuscripts are full of grammatical errors. God uses human beings to express his word and his ways, his intentions are expressed through the human writer's intentions. This is very important, I think, because that means that God's intention for this text will not contradict the human author's words or intentions. God is working through that human writer. If we assume that God's intentions are divorced from those words, then we can take that wherever we want to go. You know, God is saying through this text, whew, over here. John did, wouldn't recognize that. Moses wouldn't recognize it. But that's what we're going to make out of it, see? It's so important for hermeneutics to recognize that, that what that human writer chose to put down was guided by the Holy Spirit so that it also expressed God's intention. To break the link between the text and God's intention is to lose the authority of the Bible. You may still be speaking truth, but you no longer have God's authority if you're not paying attention to the, the words of the text. 
Those words were chosen by a human being in most cases, but they are expressing God's intent. So I think it's extremely important uh, to recognize that God's intent does not contradict the human author's intent. He chose that human writer. He gave that human writer thoughts so that they would be expressed in certain ways. He, he chose somebody who had certain experiences in life that would cause them to express things in a certain way. A question. If God's intent is given through the human writer's intent, is it limited to that? Is God's intention limited by the human author's intention? Can we say no more than that? I would argue that God's intention is consistent, but it's not limited to what Moses thought or what John thought. Moses and John did not need to understand the full intention of God in writing a text. How would we know God's expanded intention for a text? How would you come to that? By what other writers say in Scripture? Other inspired writers? Now, as you compare John and Matthew and Paul, and you might begin to see, hey, put the three together and you see something bigger. So one way that you can see a deeper meaning in a text than what the original writer understood is by comparing that writer with other scriptures, other uh, uh, divine writings. God's intention isn't limited by the original writer, but he can expand that language. History can unpack a deeper meaning in the text. You know, for example, if, if you believe in predictive prophecy, when the prophecy is fulfilled, you know some things about the prophecy you didn't before. Uh, if you ever get a chance to read chapter 2 in Deep Things of God, uh, you'll see that the fulfillment often transcended the prophecy. It was a surprise many times. Uh, wasn't Jesus a surprise? If he wasn't, why did the Jews not, not, not get it? You know? They were expecting something a little different from their reading of the text. And when the fulfillment actually came, they were surprised. And it was a challenge for them. Some got over it and some did not. So uh, uh, God can expand uh, the, uh, the text, but it'll be a natural expansion of the language. Later revelation often unpacks God's deeper intention. In other words, John can come along and say, now Isaiah said this, but let me give you the real meaning of what Isaiah was saying. Well, Isaiah himself may not have understood this. Now, from this time and place, and with God's later revelation, we see God's deeper intention. So God's later revelation becomes a powerful way to draw something deeper out of the earlier revelations. In Genesis, you may simply have stories that don't go all that deep, but then Paul says, Sarah and Hagar is an allegory. And it gives us some important information about the relationship between Christian and non-Christian Jews. Now, Sarah and Hagar would not have recognized <laughs> that expansion of their story. There's no way that they could have picked that up. But Paul comes along, and with that story in the light of the whole scripture, he says, now we can see an analogy for what Scott is doing right now inside the church. So history and later revelation can draw out deeper meanings uh, than what we might have originally uh, seen. So God uses the language of the past to describe the future. And that would be number four if you're following a number system. Number three, God's intent not limited by the human author's intent, but he uses the language of the past when he's describing the future. 
For example, in the Old Testament, many prophets talked about the exile to Babylon and the return that would come. But what language did they use when they described that God's people will go to Babylon and then he will bring them back? What was the language base for making that point? It was the Exodus story. You'll see this over and over again as you go through Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so on. The exile to Babylon will be like the Exodus. Uh, let me show you one startling place, Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11, uh, verses 15 and 16. Number four is the language of the past is used to describe the future. That, that kind of repeats number one, but in number one, my main point was just that God uses the language of the past when he's communicating. But he does that not only in describing the present, but also the future is what I want to make sure we got across here. Revelation 13 is describing the future, but he's using the Old Testament language, the language of the past, to describe that future. By the way, uh, I, I got away from it before we actually finished it, but the mark of the beast on the forehead and the hand, that's got a history too. What did the Jews put on the forehead and the hand? Scriptures, particularly Ten Commandments. They're to bind the Ten Commandments on their forehead and on their hands. And you still, if you ever fly to Israel, you'll probably at some point in the flight see an Orthodox Jew who will start wrapping his arms and putting something on his head and so on, and then he'll go in the bathroom and pray. You see? So the, the idea of wrapping the, the, the wrist and wrapping the forehead Ten Commandments, Mark of the Beast, connected to the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are a constant background in all of that. So uh, learning to detect the evidence base uh, is very important. Let's take a look at uh, how the language of the past describes the future. Isaiah 11, 15 and 16. This is a prophecy. It says, the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt and will wave his hand over the river with his scorching wind and will split it into seven channels and make a way across on foot. So there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant that is left of his people as there was for Israel when they came up out of the land of Egypt. The Exodus. But this is not a description of the Exodus. It's a prophecy of what? The exile that was to come. Now notice in here that you have a number of predictions. You have Israel will go to Assyria as captives and they will escape when a wind blows over the river, which is the river Euphrates. That's, uh, that's the Nile is not called the river. They have a different term for that, but the river is the Euphrates River, you know, the, the two great boundary rivers, uh, the people of God. So they're going to go into captivity to Assyria, and they're going to come out when God brings a wind and blows it over the Euphrates River, dries it up, and they'll walk across the river in their sandals. Now what's wrong with this prophecy? It's 100% off. Not one of those details is fulfilled. They don't go to Assyria, they go to Babylon. Uh, it isn't Israel that goes, it's Judah. The river Euphrates is dried up, but not by a wind. It's dried up by engineers for Cyrus. And people of God don't escape across that riverbed. It's Cyrus's armies that go across the riverbed. When the people of God escape, they cross the bridge by the king's command, king of Persia. So not one detail 
is fulfilled exactly as it happened. So what do you do with that? I think, I think the clues are there in what we've covered so far. But what would you do with that? Just look at that text. Somebody says to you, false prophecy. How would you defend it? Isn't that the, the spirit of the law instead of the letter of the law? Mm. Like, it's not, it's, it's showing a, an idea that that still happened, like the meaning happened, just not necessarily with the details. Okay, so the larger thing happened. They went into captivity. They were delivered in relation to the Euphrates River. So the big picture did happen. Okay. <laughs> okay, there's a, there's a one suggestion. Anyone agree with that? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> okay. Could the wind mean strife in this situation? Could the wind mean strife? Okay, so we, when, when we have a problem in the text, we start looking for alternate interpretations. Maybe the language shouldn't be taken literally. Good. Any other possibilities? Why does the wind dry up the Euphrates River in the prophecy when it's not going to happen that way? Remember the movies of the future? <laughs> okay, this is, this is not a movie of the future. <laughs> That's what takes us back to look at what they knew. Okay, he's using language familiar to them at that time. When is Isaiah writing? He's writing 712 BC. Some 712? Okay, that Bible's very confident. Uh, that may, in fact, be the date, but it's close. It's either on it or close. Uh, somewhere in the 700s. When uh, is the river Euphrates dried up to to, for the people of God to escape? When did that happen? That date we do know. 539. Now, time was moving backwards then by our reckoning, so that's almost 200 years later. Okay. Here's the problem. Babylon didn't exist. Oh yeah, it was there. There was a city called Babylon, but it was not a nation. The Assyrian Empire conquered Babylon and many others. When Isaiah is writing, it is the Assyrian Empire that rules the city of Babylon. And it is to Assyria as it was then that the people of God went. If Isaiah had said, they're going to go, you know, the empire of Babylon is going to conquer them, people say, that's a dumb prophecy. Babylon was destroyed a long time ago. No longer exists. Assyria has been there for hundreds of years and probably will be for hundreds more. So he meets them where they are. He shares with them the direction in which this exile will go without using the name of the nation that actually would bring them into exile. Babylon only came into existence again, new Babylon called by many scholars. There's old Babylon, time of Abraham. New Babylon comes into existence about 20 years before the Israelites went into captivity. Nebuchadnezzar's father, that's how new it is, Nebuchadnezzar's father conquers the Assyrians and uh, creates the kingdom of Babylon and then Nebuchadnezzar, his son, at his direction, marches on the Assyrian capital. The Egyptians don't like what's happening, and they come up to try to save what's left of the Assyrians, and there's a big battle at Carchemish around 609, 610. Five years before Jerusalem's destroyed, Assyrians are still hanging on. Babylon fully dominates only within five years of the captivity. So a prophet speaking to that future would make no sense. 
it would be talking about a nation that did not exist at that time. So I think one helpful understanding here is the prophecy is accurate. At the time it's written, there is an Israel, a larger picture. So he speaks out of that context. But then what about the wind over the Euphrates? Why that? I think you already caught it, Jerome. It's a new exodus. And in the original exodus, it's a wind that dries up the sea so the people can march across. That's the model. He uses the language of the past to describe the future. Now, when you actually get to that future, when you read it uh, you know, through the eyes of Jeremiah, uh, later on, greater clarity comes in. And uh, you begin to see that there is some intention on the part of the visiting king that comes. And you can point to Isaiah in one place where Cyrus is even named. So there's real prophecy going on here, and it's verifiable prophecy. But if you expect every detail to be fulfilled, you're missing this principle that God uses the language of the prophet's past to describe the future. So a superficial reading of the text, you just take what you read and say, well, that's what God intended, uh, could result in completely missing the point of the text. So Isaiah 11 is a, is a very uh, exciting example of the principle that God meets people where they are, that he uses the language of the past to describe the future, and that's as prophecies are fulfilled, often that the greatest clarity comes in. At the time of fulfillment, we understand how God's Word uh, led to a fulfillment. Number five, the language of revelation, the language of Scripture, is the language of the writer's past, not ours. When we read Bible prophecy, the newspaper, the websites, tend to color what we see in the biblical text. We bring our own influences to our reading of the text. We can't help seeing in our native language echoes of our own past. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll come, how do you deal with that hermeneutically? You'll say, we'll, we'll come back to that. How do you deal with that hermeneutically? But to be aware that language that we know contains echoes of our own past echoes of our childhood, echoes of our parental guidance, and so on. And we can't help bringing that to the Bible in its native language. In our native language, the Bible is constantly echoing our past. And take the Bible as it reads can mean take the Bible as it reads to me in my context. I remember a place I visited not too long ago. There was a young lady about 25 years old who was absolutely convinced that everything I was saying was wrong. Very sincere, very godly person. Everything was wrong. On what basis was it wrong? Her reading of the Bible in her native language, which was not English. And I, I got to understand from people who knew her even in her language, there were many Bibles, but only one translation was the right one. And taking that Bible, she had created a whole theology that was willing to stand firmly against, you know, 25 scholars who had come together to study those same texts from all over the world uh, in the original languages 20 years before. She was not willing to follow anything that the church had discovered on that text because her native Bible contradicted that. You, you see how easily <laughs> we tend to, to uh, settle on that which is comfortable and familiar to us. Our own experience tends to color how we read the text. Uh, the language of the book of Revelation is the language of John's past, not ours. I remember corresponding with someone about 20 years ago. And it seemed like every single text that either of us could come up with, we disagreed on. And since he was a pastor in the same denomination, 
that I happened to be in, that was kind of disconcerting. No matter what argument I brought, kind of like this, this young lady. And just there was no convincing. It was just on every point it was different. And suddenly it dawned on me. He was not reading Revelation as if it were written in 95. He was reading it as if it were written in 1995. <laughs> that the author of the book of Revelation knew Ellen White and knew the Adventist Bible commentary and knew the events of the world that he was experiencing. And I thought that the solution to our problems was plain. I wrote back, I said, I think I understand what our problem is. You're reading Revelation as if it were written in 1995, and I'm reading it as if it were written in 95. And the corollary of my argument was what? Obviously, it was written in 95, duh. <laughs> and he wrote back. <laughs> he said, you're absolutely right. You've nailed it. And he says, and I honestly believe that it's God's intention that we read it as if it were written in 1995. And thus we were not reading the same text at all. Now don't misunderstand me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it clear later on that we do need to apply the text to the patient. We do need to apply it to the congregation. We do need to apply it to our lives today. But how do you go from the intention of the human writer to God's intention, I think there needs to be a link between those two, and that link is the text. In its original context, as we see what that human writer intended by the text, God's intention will be a natural extension of that. You break that link, and uh, then you're in a, in a land that can go in many other directions than what the text goes. Now, this raises the question, what about devotional reading of the Bible? What about somebody that sits down in the morning and says, Lord, teach me something today. That young lady was doing devotionals. And she was, the, the Bible was speaking to her and she was getting information from it. Is there a time and place to do that? Is that a valid way of reading? When can one read it that way and when not? Those are the topics we'll take up uh, in the very next session.